Bueno, muy buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this fourth conversation on connectivity of the Amazon and indigenous territories, challenges for the global framework of biodiversity. We're discussing in this panel the Amazon role and the protection of biodiversity and we look to contribute to the global agenda of biodiversity. It's a series of conferences that has been promoted the North Alliance uh, of the Amazon with the support of Kevin Nature. And this fourth session, we're going to talk about the strategies, uh, social cultural strategies of the conversation uh, and to protect uh, the largest flying river. And we want to welcome our colleagues and friends, Herman Poveda, Jody Hilti, Silvio Cabrera, and Wade Davis. And particularly, especially, I want to thank and I want to welcome Avisita Chichon. That's it has the honor to moderate this session. Avisita is the leader. The uh, has the Andes Amazon Initiative in the Gordon and Betty Muir Foundation, which is maybe the most important foundation that has supported the conservation of biodiversity in the Amazon. Avisita has more than 30 years of experience in, this, in the protection of the natural resources and biodiversity in Latin America and in the Caribbean. And she currently is a member of service of committees and um, like the committees of that finances the Amazon Basin, uh, the a strategic committee of the scientific panel for the Amazon, and the green list of the International Union. But it's an honor, Avesita, that you are here with us. I really appreciate it, and I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Martin, for the generous presentation. When Martin invited me to moderate this panel, I couldn't say no. Not only because he asked me, and you can't say no to him, but also because we have the opportunity to elevate the, the profile of the Amazon by emphasizing in connectivity, which is absolutely necessary for the bioavailability and of the bioma in the long term, and emphasizing also in the need of developing uh, horizontal alliances and to have the fundamental rights of the indigenous population that manage uh, territories for themselves and for the world. With all the climate events that we're suffering today due to global warming, as like storm hurricanes in a more frequent way, droughts, uh, fires, there's undoubtedly that one of the most important solutions, or maybe the most important, is the conservation of the natural forests, tropical natural forests. The Amazon has more than 5 million square kilometers of forest, and most of it has still have an important connectivity. The Amazon have, has a high diverse uh, um, biological diverse, more than 40,000 species of plants, uh, 1,500 of, of uh, birds, mammals, more than 3,000 uh, types of fish, without counting many times of insects that we still have to document. Also in the Amazon, we have more than 200,000, 2 million, 200 million uh, of uh, thousands um, kinds of woods and uh, other kinds of diversity. And the cultural diversity also is, is extraordinary. It has more than 350 different groups of ethno-linguistics distributed in the Amazon. But all of this diversity, biological diversity and cultural biodiversity is under threat because of the expansion of the economic activities that are not sustainable 
and uh, social policies that denies their uh, rights to the indigenous people. In old times, the old people tell us history about nature. Now in the 21st century, in societies that are more urbanized, only scientists that gather these stories and have the responsibility to tell us the stories of the migrations, fish migrations and mammals in the, in the nature, the stories of metamorphosis of insects and the uses of different medicinal plants, for example. In this last year, because of COVID, we've lost many indigenous with each death one loved one was lost, and many knowledge was lost too. That's why it is very important to have a sustainable development in the communities, indigenous communities, with social equity, also to achieve a strong alliance between scientists and wise men. In today's panel, we will listen to five different professionals that will help us to think about these subjects in a creative way and with a purpose. So I have the pleasure to introduce each one of the panelists. First of all, we're going to listen to Dr. Herman Poveda. He's civil engineer, master in the use of hydraulic resources and engineer. His PhD in hydraulic resources and has a post doctorate in hydroecology. Since 1998, he has been a member of the International Panel of Experts on Climate Change. He is currently a member of the Scientific Panel for the Amazon and of the International Scientist Steering Committee of the World Research Program on Water and Energy Cycles, as well as a professor of the Department of Geosciences and Environment of the National University of Columbia. After Dr. Poveda, we're going to listen to Martin von Hildenberg, which already made the introduction. Martin is the director and president honorary of Gaia's Amazons. During the 1970s, he lived in the indigenous uh, communities, which gave him the basis to pursue his doctorate in ethnology from the University of Paris and to work with the Colombian government in the 1980s as the National Director of Indigenous Affairs. In this position, he achieved the recognition of the collective property of indigenous territories on 20 million hectares of the Colombian Amazon. Represented the Colombian government in the negotiation of ILO Convention of 169 Convention on the Rights of Indigenous and Tribal Peoples and participated in the recognition of the rights in the political constitution of Colombia in 1991. After Martin, we will be hearing Silvio Cabrera lecture. He is a technician in river basin management with a gender approach. Moreover, he's an agronomist, engineer, and master in development in environment. Currently, he is responsible for the area of forest wildlife zone six of the Ministry of Environment, Water, and Ecological Transition of Ecuador. Then we will be hearing Jody Hilty. She is a recognized wealth life corridor ecologist and conservationist with over 20 years of experience in managing large-scale conservation programs. She has been co-editor and lead author of four books. Her most recent publication is Corridor Ecology, Linking Landscapes for Biodiversity Conservation, and climate adaptation. And here I have her book. I recommend it to everyone. It's very good. She is currently president and chief scientist to the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, Y to Y. And lastly, we will be in the presence of Wade Davis, an ethnographer, writer, photographer, and filmmaker. David graduated in anthropology and biology and has a PhD in ethnobotany, all from Harvard University. He has written around 14 books 
And the most recent one is Magdalena, it's about Colombia. It was published last year in 2020, and he has contributed to the production of many films about different local communities. Wade spent three years in the Amazon and Andes as a plant explorer, living among 15 indigenous groups from eight Latin American nations. And he was able to make 6,000 botanical collections. Later, his book, One River, is a fundamental reading for everyone who would like to improve and understand our Amazon. I have he, right here my old copy, my beloved and old copy of One River that I read when I was in the Kurubamba River in 1997. Currently, Wade Davis is a honorary professor of anthropology in at the University of, of British Columbia in Canada. So we are here with an amazing panel with very special and wide, with wide experience and pe people with wide experience from an ecological and anthropologic point of view. So now we will be hearing our first panelist, Dr. Germán Poveda. Poveda, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Avisita. Thank you, everyone, especially Martin, for the invitation. It is a pleasure being here today. The title of my presentation is There is no future if we keep on supporting the destruction of processes in this life. And I'm in engineering, and I will be referring to systems that support water, air, and forests. We shouldn't consider it as a natural resource, but as a system which it has life and it deserves conservation. I will start from recommending and uh, one of the missions that we did in Colombia. And the recommendation was to change the current development model and for the exploitation mainly of fossil fuels and, agricultural and primary agricultural products to jump from a, from a current state to a bioeconomy that uh, explores our, our extraordinary biodiversity and through the usage of technologies that allows to redesign materials, products, food, new cosmetics, new molecules, new patents, new materials that allow to uh, take advantage of our own resources and adds value to deve sustainable develop Colombia. Now we know that Colombia is one of the mega diverse countries in the world. This is the, a map of World War Forest Watch implies the importance of the territory in the presence of different types of animals and plants that depend on forests. So that presence of this extraordinary biodiversity is connected to the richness that Colombia has. And I believe is the most important richness that Colombia has for its future. However, we are polluting, we are uh, eliminating forests, we are causing uh, pollution and, and a loss, an important loss to the life of ecosystems. That is, we are shooting ourselves or killing ourselves. So I think we should restructure our relation with nature in Colombia in order to stop fragmentation, deforestation, and pollution, as well as ecosystem loss that sustains life. So in order to do so, I would like to deep dive in topics such as deforestation. And I think that's a huge concern because we have already deforested 50% of the tropical forest. And I think deforestation is one of the causes of COVID-19. It, it just disrupts the hydrological cycle and it uh, disrupts hydrometeorological it causes floods and intense storms, of all, but also droughts. Deforestation causes desertification, loss of soil and ecosystem services, as well as contributes to the increase of, of global temperature, not only because 
because of the tree loss, but also uh, the many ecosystem services that the forest provides. The deforestation, of course, caused by diversity loss and threatens that future, uh, bioeconomic future that Colombia may have. And we know that deforestation is caused uh, because of an economic distortion that allows that process it's uh, because of a, an equal economy towards the environment. That's what it is necessary to reassess an economic model that consider in the national bills different indicators or different to the GDP, the current GDP that and other indicators that have more to do with the life uh, stability. In order to show the deforestation process in the Amazon since to the, from 2001 to 2019, this is data from Global Watch. We, we can see the deforestation process. We see in red deforestation progress. In 20 years, we have lost 19% of the Amazon basin and is it's in natural forest. Of course, in Colombia, we are aware of that problem and deforestation numbers are very concerning. This is the time series of annual deforestation from 2001 to 2020. According to Global Wars Forest Watch, last year we went from 224,000 acres. So yesterday we knew about numbers that indicates this mostly currently we have half of that number and that is very concerning because we are not under any controls uh, of this data. I believe these figures are very important. We cannot afford continue destroying the forest in this way. So I have some pictures from Romero that shows how we are moving on with deforestation in the Amazon, even areas that are part of natural parks that supposedly are areas, are untouchable areas are seeing this process as well. The impacts of deforestation, as we know, is 20% of, of gas emissions that cause climate change. And we also have a responsibility in climate change mitigation because we have to stop deforestation in order to stop contributing to uh, emission gases. And it also causes an alteration of the wind circulation regimens. Here we can see the winds coming from the Atlantic towards the Amazon and the oriental part of the at Andes, and then when it, it touches the Andes, moves again back, carrying a big amount of water that generates in Atlantic Ocean and also because of the transpiration of the Amazon water. Then you you can see flying rivers that carry big amounts of water that are important for the supply of the rivers in the southern part of South America. Here we have an animation that shows how is the transport of the water in the South American continent and the role of the forest to control that water supply and the intake of that water from the lower part of the Amazon to the Andes towards the Andes glaciers to cities such as Bogota, Quito, and Lima that depend on that water. And if we continue on destroying the Amazon forest, we put this water supply under threat. So here we have an animation of a climate model between December 2004 and March 2005. The, the colors show in purple are less water concentration. And in white is more con water concentration. It is an effect similar to a heartbeat that is similar to the process of the water transpiration, the process in the, from the trees. And that at night, the, the effect stopped. That's why we see that heartbeat-like effect. And here we see that formation over the Amazon forest until uh, the Andes, Mount, mountain range supplies water to the glaciers and the tropical glaciers, as well as the southeast of this of, in South America, including La Plata River. What 
happens in the Amazon forest has to do with a problem and it's the water supply and a continental scale and it's one of the purposes of this cycle. So this means that the forestation uh, in the Amazon, it's a threat, not only to this transpiration, which is a cooling process that's help, that helps to mitigate climate change and helps water supply to the cities and the ecosystems. So this deforestation process has to be stopped. One of the, one of the main things is that in tropical basins such as the Amazon, around 50% of the water that falls in the basin is generated in transpiration of the forest itself. So if we cut the forest, we stop this extraordinary mechanism where transpiration of the forest contributes to the to this cycle. It's called recycled rain. And if we keep on deforesting, we will stop this amazing water supply mechanism for the continent as a whole. The fires in the Amazon and deforestation not only cut the water supply, but also the air quality in South America. We see, we've seen this with the fires in 2019, when one day in the afternoon in, in Sao Paulo turned into night, precisely of the polluting particles provoked or caused, originated in the fires that allowed the deregulation uh, of the control of the first station due to the missed uh, bleeding of the Bolsonaro government. And here we see the carbon emissions during those fires and how it affects the quality in the air in South America, in the South American continent. And this has enormous consequences in terms of quality. So I was mentioning that the forest station is part of the cause of this pandemic because deforestation with the illegal hunting and animal trafficking, it allows the contact between wildlife and humans. And this virus at its origins had deforestation as one of its causes. So because of these reasons, since deforestation is part of this, is one of the main important issues that put civilization in threat. And one of those is climate change and the pandemic. And for those two reasons, deforestation should be stopped at a global level. And how can we stop deforestation? I have a series of ideas. One of the first I want to mention is that we should a sign a peace agreement with nature. In Colombia, we signed a peace agreement with the gorillas. And we have to step up and sign an, a, a peace agreement with nature because we are causing the Sith mass extinction as Hillary, the human species has become in a serial environmental killer. I have many other ideas, but maybe I can talk about it in the Q&A session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Herman. Excellent presentation. Uh, good floor to Martin, Come on, please. OK, thank you. So I would like to thank Herman uh, for his excellent presentation for enhancing the importance of the woods, of the forests, and to avoid deforestation and its impact, and let's call it uh, systems, life systems, and or ecosystemic services. I want to. Um, I want to talk to you about this picture as we're looking here. We're being managed by uh, COVID. We're very worried about beyond COVID, we have something that's worse for the planet that's, that's recession. And, and the larger majority of poor people that has been generated because of these consequences, because also COVID, and uh, because we don't, we can't work. And we also have the climate change, and it is uh, very dangerous. Uh, global warming, we're going to have lack of water, we're going to have floods uh, or more heat, but most of it is the loss of biodiversity. So we're simply to represent in this drawing, uh, most of us were worried in, uh, about COVID, and of course it's right, but we don't talk about for the loss of biodiversity and the, collapse, and the collapse of life on the planet. We don't talk about it, and uh, it is the largest threat that we have, not only the global warming, 
uh, not only for the pollution of rivers, of seas, the agriculture that we have, many factors that are behind that. Also, it is a development, uh, a wrong uh, economy that we continue to, to abuse in nature as if nature was endless. So it is a vision a way to understand the relationship between humans and nature as if we were, if we were owned the nature, as if nature was the thing that we could uh, use endlessly without having a very dangerous consequences for human and for life in, on the planet. On the presentation, uh, well, before I, I wanted to talk about some 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 issues we were talking about uh, how could we contribute to uh, have uh, protection for our biodiversity and how can we take it to take it to 30 percent who are right now 70 percent we want to take it to 30 percent and in the first panel and uh, we, we looked some for alternatives complementary complementary alternatives to the protected areas and we talked about the, the indigenous territories and the indigenous territories protect the biodiversity it is demonstrated that they protected very well for diverse reasons but maybe one of the most important reasons that Davies maybe is going to talk to us a little bit about it is that their understanding of the nature, their vision of the relationship between humans and nature, because uh, we don't, they don't see the nature as, a, as nature as, a, as something that we can exploit. But we belong to this community. We belong to this great community, which is uh, all. Uh, people, all uh, uh, subjects of this um, element are mutually participant and we are part of that community. It's another vision. And this vision make them to take care of these elements from the, and they've been doing that for thousands of years, which is very important for the participation in the future of the planet, like they've done in the past. So it is very important to talk also, as we say, as we see this in Latin America as an opportunity to, to, to complement this, and uh, we see uh, what has been denounced by surviving international in Africa because of the fear that they had to raise to 30%, uh, maybe uh, that indigenous territories are being, are going to be controlled and maybe the indigenous people are going to to put out, put them out of there to to defend biodiversity. Uh, instead of building together, it's an imposing of the government, and the indigenous can agree with that. And neither of us respect the indigenous people, and we have the, we know they have a very important mission for the planet, and we couldn't agree with that. Not only it is the indigenous people and their territory is their way of understanding and their territories. In the other panels also, it means that we, we must to talk uh, to each other how, on how we're going to build the biodiversity and the way to protect the planet. We need to, to talk to each other and to build with the people. It means that the government the indigenous people, the civil society and the scientists, and all together, uh, the uh, religious movement. And we have to build together the solutions for this. And in the, in the other panels, we also talked about it. We also talked about how to, to build mosaics that is going, to, how it's going to be built in the east of Brazil. Please, the next image. This map, if we look uh, to this map, this is the map of the north of the Amazon, and we can see that we have a very extensive region, and this part, we, are, we talked in the, in the panels that in this part of the East Amazon, we have the great mosaic that is there are many governments and indigenous people and local populations trying to articulate 
and to have a coherent, uh, complementary way to the protection of biodiversity and the territories. And it is also very important, like Herman said, for the construction and the conservation of the forests and also for the systems, life system that we could also say, call them uh, ecosystemic service. We also see that here in the Putumayo River, uh, with the Chicago Museum, it has been it has been built an important mosaic where people from Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, governments, par uh, parks, indigenous people, and, and NGOs, and they are building. Also, we saw here in Sangai Polocarpus, in the south of Ecuador, it has also been built. So we know that here in Colombia there are a series of corridors. What I mean with this? is that now that we talk in the, like in, in the panels, I want to talk also of this uh, mosaic we have in this map, this uh, mosaic that goes from the Andes to the Atlantic, that we, the headman talked about it, the, about the flying rivers, the importance of flying rivers and this water steam, and also uh, like Herman told me before, if we see from space, we see the dark clouds here because we see where it rains the most, the uh, evil transpiration is the most. And it is very important for the Amazon and in the Andes and for the Andes. And we have protected areas here and, and there are protection areas and we have 70% uh, of this territory we have deforestation well, for of course, in Piedemonte, we have in Horaima also, we have to see how to solve that, solve that. But I want to say is that this exists. We're not starting this. This is, we're harvesting what exists and has already existed and, or what has been built by the governments, by the civil societies, by the indigenous people, by the scientists, how it was built, this great mosaic, and they want to make it stronger. And we see how the governments have agreements, regional agreements, and and, the, and for the for the uh, British agreement for this uh, international agreements. Also, they have signed uh, with many different norms and, uh, and agreements between the countries. And how the local governments, the governors, have made this agreement, this initiative of uh, a, a weather change where everybody is helping for conservation. So from the government, we have uh, foundations to build, to respecting uh, how the sovereignty uh, for this country. We're not saying that somebody is going to impose to the other one. And if there are territories that are in the Brazilian territory, the Brazilian government did it, uh, the Colombian government did what it had to do also, Venezuela, Ecuador also. They have signed agreements and have the constitution that recognized the constitution. And we have the legal foundations. We see the foundations. There are indigenous people are fighting also for their territory and they want to talk and uh, to want to build with the civil societies and the governments. The scientists are also coordinated and particularly how in this scientist panel, they are coordinate uh, all the scientists for the protection of the Amazon. So the NGOs, together in this great territory that we have here, we see how they have worked together with NGOs to form alliance uh, and an alliance to, that is promoted in these panels. And they are working together for more than 30 years in acknowledgement of the territories and, uh, and, to, and how to strengthen their governments and to look for economic alternatives. So we see they have a large quantity of elements to consolidate this territory. This territory is a territory of 260 million hectares, the largest continuous forest in the world. And we can't uh, be uh, it can't be deforested like it's happening in the south of Brazil. We have to preserve it, like to to we want to protect the planet. We have the obligation to have to protect this forest. 
And this means to develop a new economy. When we talk about an economy, uh, now Carlos Nobles promotes it very much, which it talks about the biocommerce. It is true. We can develop and we must develop an economy that is um, ecologically good, but that's not enough. We have projection in uh, uh, so much individualism. Uh, we must inspire uh, in the indigenous people and there and in many people that think that way. It must be an economy that's more so, a more collective economy that can uh, that's more cooperative. We have the uh, neoliberal vision to exploit the natural resources in the biocommerce. We would term into that. To, our problem is not only to be kind with nature. Our, the problem is the way of thinking, our way of seeing the nature and to understanding our economy, our development. Uh, it's uh, your time is finished. Okay, I wanted to finish. Uh, this is the big challenge that we face, and I see that very feasible because we have all the elements that make it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for your message. We will be talking about in the Q&A session. Next, we will be hearing Silvio Cabrera's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All experts are participating with their experience and mainly with the guidelines that allows us to contribute with actions to guarantee the conservation of our ecosystems and the lives of the species as well as the human beings inhabiting these territories. In the case that of my presentation, it is directly related to the application of an active regulation that allows us to establish other forms or measures of conservation in the territories. And my colleagues here today have expressed uh, well-centered criteria regarding the protected area systems that each and one of us have in their own territories. In Ecuador, it happens the same. We have a great biodiversity representing 91 uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystems and 21 ocean ecosystems of all uh, exist in the world. But inside that, we also have the presence of peoples and nationalities that many of those are outside the territories that are protected in the uh, declaration of uh, national protected area. However, in our constitutions, the rights of the peoples and nations are recognized in their territories but apart from that, it is necessary to be able to articulate these local and territorial strategies that are present. And in fact, in our country, we uh, or some peoples have already an identification of their territories and five are in the coastal areas, nine in the mountains and others in the Amazon. So these peoples live with our natural resources. They preserve and they do conservation, doing at the same time their social, economic, and cultural activities inside these territories. However, the strategies that this the government implements should put more in evidence which or what is the interaction the, the interaction between the territories providing a response for its conservation in the future. So in this context, Ecuador, because of its privileged position, shares a biodiversity richness with other countries is inside of the group of countries, the mega diverse countries in the world. And we have a national system of protected areas. We have 72 
protected areas integrated in the government systems as well as in communal and municipality systems. And this is of a very high importance because it allows us to incorporate territories inside of the national protected areas in where the fundamental actors are the peoples and the communities that are in, in those territories. By recognizing the national system of protected areas, the, these subsystems have the opportunity to have uh, more participation from their actors, not only from the government or represented by the central or the autonomous governments in a state level, but also having the link and the direct incorporation of the people's nationalities and communities in the decision-making process regarding what can be done in their territories in the national regulatory framework so they can incorporate their interests, their needs, and mainly the desires of the peoples and, national, and nations because the only strategy that we have in our country that ensures the state of conservation of these territories is inside of the national protected area systems that are exempt to do attractivism, productive activities, changes in the use of soil, etc. That is, these are the only territories that guarantee and ensure the conservation of the richness that are there. It is very important to highlight these topics because in Ecuador, we have already seen experiences of communal protected areas in which the community and the peoples have stated that their territories are under this category, the maximum conservation category that we have in our government. Moreover, since 2020, Ecuador has been making efforts in establishing other conservation strategies and how to complement what has been already established in the national protection system, and that is the incorporation of a corridor regulation, which is basically incorporating the technical criteria to this establishing and manage connectivity corridors in Ecuador. So having such regulation, this instrument can be applied and used by nations and peoples in the autonomous decentralized governments, that is the actors of those territories in order to maximize the conservation of protected areas, but as well as to have a strategy that enhances the conservation, integration, and management of the territories used uh, far further than these protected areas. In this case, in Ecuador, we are not talking about uh, an, a protected area. We are talking about a regional territory that incorporate protected areas as well as other forms of conservation that are present there, including productive process on the, under the sustainable development development that allows these populations to live in better conditions, improving their lives as well. So the corridors is important in Ecuador. These are special areas for biodiversity preservation that mainly are established between the protect, national protected areas and other special areas for biodiversity conservation in uh, sustainable management administration. That is the concept where the regulation is established. And we are working on that as a clear example and establishing the recognition of the Sangai Polkarpov's corridor. And I will refer to it later. But what are the objectives inside of this regulation? Contributing to the strengthening of the conservation object objectives and the national protected areas, reduce the landscape fragmentation ecosystems, mainly those fragile ecosystems and biodiverse inside those territories that are part of the national protected area systems, keeping the migratory flux of different species that we have in order to ensure the ecologic balance in those territories and the interaction that we have with the living and the wildlife that ensures the stability inside of those territories. Moreover, to boost the sustainable 
use of natural resources and recuperation of degraded areas to benefit biodiversity and local populations, to enhance the cap adaptation capacity to climate change, improving their ecosystem resilience and human settlements, improve the participation of the autonomous decentralized governments, uh, pro private pro proprietors in communities that have special ecosystems that, that must be protected and articulate with planning instruments and territorial management, local instruments, this, um, this regulation. Having an agreement by the central government is uh, an obligation to incorporate in the planning and man management of the central autonomous governments in that territory and the participation and the uh, participation of the communities present in these territories. So how can we articulate the participation process from local actors? It is based on an interinstitutional coordination since the, the establishment of these corridors is given by the national authority in the ministry, but that must coordinate with the autonomous government, sectorial entities, with the obligations that each one of those have in each part in, with interest in, in to promote these processes. So after having these definitions, let's see where can we focus on the design of these corridors, how to justify the process to define one territory that can be managed in the future under the vision of a corridor. It is defined based on an integral analysis of response. This model considers each one of the variables that looks for an evidence to a level of intensity of human activity, ecological activity that is done in the territory. This basis allows us to bring elements from a scientific point of view that allows to justify the territories that we are proposing, not only from the strategy standpoint that are already being implemented in protected area and the communities, but also the pressures that we have inside of this territory, the threats and the opportunities that are generated that can be seen in the long and short term. Inside of the corridor management, connectivity corridor management, basically this process, this participation process must be established. That is, these are not isolated phases, but all are complementary. From the moment that a need is established in that territory, this is consolidating in the future to guarantee this. The objective of this establishment is not recognizing that we already have a corridor, but the true challenge is how to make these objectives that have as a goal to improve the participation of the actors and the territories is actually turned into a reality. So that construction process is the identification, establishment, and management has to be uh, through a participation process. How can we ensure the establishing connectivity corridors with the participation of decentralized autonomous governments? The corridors must be in, from the citizen, uh, not only the central government should propose this, but also the communities and the people's na nations who come together and see this as an opportunity to guarantee their own territories and means of life in the future. So the corridors processes should be flexible, adaptive, and articulated with their own conditions of, their, of each and one of the territories. This means that the local interest actors in, the, in establishing these corridors can create groups that promote uh, in an institutional sectorial way. This is not only based on an institution, and that is the topic and the corridor regulation. And I have a clear example. This is the corridor. Thank you very much. This is one of the examples that we have in practice in Ecuador. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvio. There's no doubt that this case in the corridor in Ecuador is fundamental to learn how to improve our processes. Next, we will be having Jody Hilti. Please, Jody. Um, so it's really, um, it's wonderful to hear all of these speakers um, and to really hear this vision around 
understanding that the whole landscape from waters to, to indigenous peoples living in the landscape to mountains matters. And, and it's something that's really close to my heart. I actually often talk about the Amazon because um, I run the Yellowstone Yukon Conservation Initiative and we're trying to do something very similar in this region. But today I'm gonna to talk at a much higher level about some of the policies and standards um, and particularly around ecological connectivity that can support work in the Amazon and other large uh, landscape and seascape initiatives. So I'm speaking on behalf of literally hundreds of people because when we went to um, uh, design these, these guidelines, it was really about working towards global agreement. And so there are some gray hairs in my in, in, that I have now, which is a result of um, trying to work around the world on that global agreement. So the purpose of trying to work towards standards for connectivity is to support all of the great work from the ground to the policy level that's moving forward on connectivity. When we look around the world, there are so many efforts and I'll talk about a few of them or at least reference them. And um, they're really cool. Um, but the thing is, is that they are kind of all over the place. And so um, as a world, just like protected areas are globally defined. And if you go to a protected area in Latin America or you go to a protected area in Africa, they are the same. They fall under the same IUCN definition. And so inside the guidelines, of course, they're sort of trying to consolidate the wealth of knowledge and practices, but really what's important is about having concrete, tangible guidelines that define what it means to conserve connectivity. And secondly, uh, uh, something that's in progress that's recommended in the guidelines is that we actually start to track where we have conserved ecological corridors around the world. And this is really important because just like protected areas, if we don't know what is actually conserved, we will continue to lose it. I'm not going to go into the background of why we need connectivity, the science behind it and developing a common language, but I wanted you to know that it's in there. Science supports, and I think other speakers have spoken to this, that uh, protected areas that are isolated and that are not connected are more likely to lose biodiversity. And so we really have to think at large landscape and seascape scales and, and plan for connectivity between protected areas. I did want to show this graph where in the green, you can see we're marching forward on terrestrial protected areas. We are making progress, maybe not as much as some of us think we need to, but likewise, in more recent years, we've really seen a lot of movement on, on marine protected areas. Unfortunately, we're not doing as well on connectivity. At global scales, when scientists look at where are forests connected, we call it structural connectivity, it's about 10% of our protected areas appear to be protected just looking at that structural connectivity. How much of that 10% is actually conserved? How many of those areas that are currently connected will be lost? How many will be deforested? We don't know. That's why this is important. So the IUCN Connectivity Specialist Group worked really closely with a lot of groups, but particularly with the United Nations Commission uh, uh, for Migratory Species. And we, can't, we, we needed a definition at a high level. And here it is, ecological connectivity is the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes that sustain life on earth. We also made it really clear for the scientists that like to talk about genes and gametes and propagules that there is a scientific definition that underlays that sort of higher level, more policy definition. When we were talking about ecological corridors, we realized um, that, that you know, one of the problems is that some people talk about 
places like the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative as a corridor. And it's really not. It's a series of protected areas that need connectivity in between. And when we we're moving forward with this area-based de definition of an ecological corridor, um, it was really clear that it needed to be separate and distinct from protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures or OECMs. The other thing is, is that if we can get protected areas and OECMs to address connectivity, that's great. But there are some places where there's a lot of human activities where it's not appropriate for them to be protected areas or OECMs. And that is where it's really important to be able to have a corridor designation. But ultimately protected areas and OECMs need to function in a large scale with ecological corridors. And I just put up this example from Western Thailand, where you can see sort of green protected areas, uh, tan wildlife sanctuaries, and the boxes are those areas where they're focusing on the connectivity aspect. And that really gets into what is an ecological network, because really that's what we're trying to do in places like the Amazon and in the Y2Y region and other large landscapes and seascapes around the world is make sure that protected areas and OECMs are not isolated, but rather that there's a third leg of the stool and that is connectivity is conserved between them. Because we know that protected areas will do better when they're in a network in, in maintaining con, uh, biological diversity over the long term. So this is a, a little bit of a complex model of what this looks like with protected areas in green uh, and blue, uh, OECMs in brown, and these lighter areas, sort of grayish areas, are areas of connectivity. And they can be um, disjunct, they can be stepping stones for, for species in water and also for volant species for animals that fly. The real meat of the, the uh, guidelines is really around what, how, what, how do you get to uh, a conserved ecological area? And so there are very clear guidelines, like defining exactly what it is that you're trying to conserve the connectivity for, um, like making sure that you've delineated it. We can't have connectivity everywhere because we know that humans will just continue to degrade. We need to have really clear areas and really clear boundaries of what can happen in there and what can't happen in there. So I'm not gonna go through the details of these, but I wanted you to know that they're in there um, and that they're very clearly defined. And I'll remind you that ecological corridors are not a substitute for protected areas or OECMs, but really they're about connecting them. We don't want corridors that go to nowhere, but rather corridors that can create a network of protected areas. And they have to have be really clearly defined what, what are the objectives, and they have to be managed and governed for clear outcomes and for the long term. Um, and, you know, they can be natural areas and areas that conserve biodiversity, but they don't have to be, right? Again, for some animals, let's say tigers, it might be that they're able to get through some low level of um, agriculture, um, but that hunting maybe shouldn't be allowed in a place or something like that. So defining what's allowed and not allowed is important. In the realm of the Amazon, I think it's pretty cool to think about um, the conservation of airspace. And I will tell you that we didn't cover a lot of that because it's so new, but I think in the Amazon, thinking about the, you know, the, 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 the flying river, that that's an area that um, could be further developed. Um, and it was, it was nice to hear Silvio talking about sort of more of the legal and policy mechanisms, because I think what we're seeing is that countries and regions that have really clear legislation do better. I, we do talk about a lot of the other kinds of tools that exist in the absence of that kind of legislation that can still move forward connectivity, but um, there are a lot of different countries, Bhutan, Costa Rica, uh, uh, now uh, Tanzania have all approved 
um, ecological corridor legislation to provide a way to report it, to provide some guidelines to how to do it, and also resources. So um, I think that that's a really important piece to aspire towards everywhere. Um, I want to mention, you know, of course, there's a lot of law and policy that that really uh, and and global agreements that actually depend on connectivity to get done. The only one I'm going to talk about today is the Convention for Biological Diversity. Um, in in the the past agreements, connectivity was uh, certainly a part of it. And one of the things and the reasons that we at the IUCN Connectivity Specialist Group were putting forward these guidelines is actually to support or a strengthening of connectivity in the next set of guidelines that will be uh, uh, drawn out in Kunming. I'm get, they say fall of 2021, but I think it moved to 2022 now. And there are a couple of targets in the draft framework that are already highlighting connectivity. And one of the, the um, things that we're working for on is um, you know, making sure that that's strong, but also that there's a reporting tool. So we're currently working with the Protected Air Planet group who they maintain the planet on protected areas so that countries can start reporting where they are conserving ecological corridors in the long term. I will mention that, that um, the guidelines have um, a bunch of examples, including from the Amazon, of ecological uh, corridors and ecological networks that are sort of in the process of moving down um, uh, to be to be could be globally recognized in the future. And um, in case that that's helpful. And again, just want to say thanks to all of the many entities that have supported this work over time. And um, it is available for download. It's in French, English, and Spanish, and will soon be available in. Um, Chinese. So happy to take questions whenever Ave allows it. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Jody. Gracias. Thank you very much, Jody. It's great to work all about this work of corridors and activity and uh, globally speaking. So now we're going to listen to Wave Davis. Wave, please. I would really like to speak about um, memory and how little we know, and how much we think we know. You know, after 50 years of research, we still haven't even begun to scratch the surface of ethnobotanical knowledge in the Amazon. We be haven't begun to really assay the biological wealth of the basin. What we know of hydrology, climate remains embryonic, but particularly what we don't know is the gift of the indigenous people. You know, in 1541, when, when, um, when uh, Francisco de Aureliano with Caspar de Carvajal went down the Amazon, they didn't find an empty forest. They found a homeland of millions and millions of people, an artery of civilization. But by the time, but by the time that the, the modern explorers, and particularly the anthropologists, entered um, the Amazon, of course, disease had swept away 90% of the populations, and there was an emergent caboclo culture of a kind of mestizo culture inspired by indigenous ideas, but very much a syncretic fusion of, of two worlds. And of the original indigenous people, all that existed in the lower reaches of the Amazon were kind of whispered messages uh, in the forest, footsteps in the sand. And anthropologists were drawn to the quote unquote real Indians, those who still inhabited the remote reaches of the upper Amazon, often in an arc along the eastern flanks of the Andes, protected from the west by the Cordillera, from the east by the cataracts in the distance of geography. And these societies tended to be endogenous, uh, marrying amongst themselves, often in open conflict with their neighbors. And that strategy of life reinforced the sense we had of the inherent fragility of the Amazon, uh, a people living in a kind of precarious existence like the forest itself. And this became kind of the cliche of anthropology. And the question became, what happened to those civilizations that Aureliana had reported? And gradually evidence emerged, evidence of high civilization, areas of land in the Amazon, collectively the size of France, of black man-made soil. 
uh, incredible sophistication in belief systems. And we suddenly understood that to have tried to understand the Amazon in the wake of the disease and the wake of the rubber exploitation would be like trying to understand the British Empire uh, or, or London itself from the perspective of the Hebrides once London had been nucleated by atomic war. And the question that has always um, arisen uh, is there a place where the ancient voices of the indigenous people can still be heard in the wake of all these ravages? And the answer is that there is. And it's in the homeland of the Barasana and the Makuna and the other so-called peoples of the Anaconda, the Tanimukus that Martin knows so well. Now, when I first went to visit these societies in the 1970s, it felt like something important had happened a long time ago, long forgotten today. And then something quite miraculous happened, not just ethnographers like Stephen Hugh Jones, but our own Martin von Hildebrand, told by the president of Colombia, Vigilio Barco, to do something for the indigenous people. And in five incredible years, Martin he does more than something. He secures legal land tenure to an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom. And behind that veil of isolation created by the troubles of the contemporary Colombian state, a whole new dream of culture was born, inspired in good measure by the work of Gaia itself. And I remember when Martin and I made a film, we asked some elders, why did you allow the missionaries to be here, the caucheros to be here? And they looked at us and they said, because they promised to make us human. And of course, this was the essence of, of colonization, to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. All of this was almost lost, but it wasn't. And then the rebirth of culture. And just in time, because this, this is what we know, the Barasana and the Makuna are indeed connected to those ancient civilizations, if only because of their sophistication of their belief systems. Cosmologies that in fact amount to nothing more or less than complex land management plans dictating exactly how people could live in great numbers in the upland forests of the Amazon. Cosmologies and myths that actually make people part of the regeneration of life itself. The, the great culture heroes, the Iowa, who came up the Milk River from the East and gave order to nature. For these societies, people aren't the problem, we are the solution, because it's only through the human imagination that the harmony of nature can be maintained. The most profound cultural insight of the Barasana and the Makuna is that plants and animals are only people in another dimension of reality. The malokas are models of the universe. And when they take their uh, sacraments, ayahuasca or yahe, they don't become symbols of the ancestors, they become the literal ancestors who journey through space to revisit the points of origin, again, to maintain this harmony of the world. And these aren't vestigial ideas. These aren't ideas from hippie ethnography. These are profound insights into the nature of being alive, profound lessons that the Barasana teach us when they take their rightful place at the council of human knowledge. These aren't people that are vestigial in any way. These are individuals who have every right to be at the council of, of, of knowledge that will determine the future of Colombia. I'll tell you, a mama once said to me, Mamo Camilo, la paz no vale nada si es solamente una manera en que los varios lados del conflicto pueden unificarse para mantener una guerra contra la naturaleza. Tenemos que tener paz con la naturaleza. And that is a message of the Barasana. So when we really think of these cultures, um, consider for a moment what their very existence their voice is alive today in the dialogue that will determine the future, not only of Colombia, but of all the Amazon, indeed, perhaps of all the world. Their traditions are based on the uh, accumulation of wisdom and knowledge through time, through priestly study and initiation. Status accrues not to the warrior, but to the individual of wisdom. Their malokas rival in grandeur, the great architectural creations of humanity. They have a complex understanding of astronomy, solar calendars, intense notions of hierarchy and specialization. 
Their wealth is invested in ritual regalia as elegant as that of a medieval court. Their systems of exchange, infinitely complex, facilitate peace, not war, not the least of which is a marriage rule that says you must marry someone who speaks a different language. So in any one longhouse, you'll have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a, a, a distinct tongue. Their way of life is to facilitate exchange, trade, and peace, not conflict. And more critically, their struggle to bring order to the universe, to maintain the energetic flows of life, and the very specificity of their beliefs and adaptation really does leave open the remarkable possibility that the Barasana and the Makuna are the survivors, the direct descendants of a world that once existed, the complex societies and chieftains that so astonished Aureliana and Carvajal, the so-called lost civilizations of the Amazon. But more importantly, in the adaptation and cultural survival of the Barasana and the Makuna and all the peoples of the Northwest Amazon of Colombia, we can actually glimpse something of the beliefs and convictions that allowed millions of people to live along the banks of the world's greatest river. And so when the Barasana today engage in ritual and take Yahe, this astonishing potion, and when they say that they travel in multiple dimensions, reliving the journey of the Iowa, the thunders, the four culture heroes, alighting on the sacred sites, accomplishing all of these remarkable spiritual deeds, it is because they really do. And when we say that the Barasana and their neighbors both echo the ancient pre-Columbian past and point a way forward, embodying a model of how human societies really can live and thrive in the Amazon basin without laying waste to the forest, it is because they really can. Their voices are not vestigial. They are dynamic, alive, and hugely consequential as we contemplate the future of this greatest forest on earth. Thanks very much. Muchas gracias, Wade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wade. What beautiful pictures and impressive pictures what you said on what they, they left, why they left them in, because they promised to be human. So it is a very strong notion to think that the, in the between between Bartolome de las Casas and Juan Hines de Sepulpe was a, was a debate if the indigenous people were humans or not, it is really impressive. Thank you very much, everybody. To all the panelists, we've had many different ideas to talk, to talk about. What I would like to do right now is to ask uh, something very specific. In the context of looking at the Amazon as a bioma, we know that the conservation of only 30% of the Amazon should be feasible because we know that the Amazon, we need to preserve at least 70% of the forest uh, so that we know uh, get to an extreme level of becoming a plain, uh, plain land. But uh, talking about this 17% uh, to 30% protection, as Martin said, if this is done, uh, it had to, to be taken in account uh, the responsibility, the priorities of the indigenous populations. In that context, I would like to ask the panelists, what would you recommend, uh, would you give to CBD to avoid to have that dichotomy uh, of nature versus culture? How can you think in corridors and conservation areas that has included their perspective and the indigenous rights? Who would like to start? I think that has been said is that the ancestral knowledge is very important not only to 
to talk about uh, in the teaching of related to the environment and the knowledge that has, the, the, the tribute has accumulated and the ancestral people that have lived for millennials in Latin America. It's very important to involve them in the, in, in the teaching of the primary school, secondary and university, not only to raise for the knowledge of the knowledge of, of of scientific knowledge, but to have um, a more sustainable development. And I think uh, that developed countries must finance this uh, countries with uh, uh, littered by the Amazon, different Amazon countries also, and involved with the Amazon communities as well. One of the, what, in the Amazon people live about 40 million people in the Amazon. So it is very important to involve them. It is important to to guarantee their preservation and development and their sustainable in a sustainable way. As I said in the in the beginning, we have to abandon uh, the bad science because it benefits in the short term that process, but it does not know the uh, environmental service of the systems that support life. So we have to apply the, the environment economy. We have to apply also what the United Nations recommend also. And I think what the, the Pope Francisco said, he has, he has said that a diagnosis, a reserved uh, diagnosis between the, uh, the economic development model and that is not uh, is not right for for the development of the human civilization. The Pope says that we have to rethink and position um, regarding the nature. I think this is a very important message. And we don't we don't like the Catholic religion. Many other religions of the world, the Buddhist, the Mohammedans, the Jewish, and other religions, uh, they all. Say uh, they also talk about uh, about different stages of global change and how to uh, can we rebuild the relationship with the nature because it, uh, it is our ethical problem and more problem. I think, uh, as I've said before, the language is very important. We have to stop about talking only about natural resources, and uh, we think we must think also and in a way that that we can think that we have. Uh, infinite resources, so that also counts. We, let's talk about it as a system that supports life. I think the laws in Colombia is having good results in terms of considering the different types of, of systems. Uh, also, for example, the, 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 the Amazon in Colombia is recognized by the, by the Congress in Colombia, like the different rivers also and the Paramo de Pisba, a national park of, of Colombia that has been recognized also. I think there is a very important leadership in Colombia and we hope that in the practice it becomes a reality. As I said, I think the, the economy is the future of Colombia and the Amazon com countries. And that's why we're proposing this mode of development based on, based on economy. I think this is the only way to break the paradox between the developments uh, sustainable development and economic development because we have to preserve the forest and we have to profit by also to to, to, uh, to profit by this the richness of the forest and we have to implement the plans to adapt to the global change we have to talk a lot about this and and we have to also do more about it this other critics are important from their perspective that we have to rethink uh, about this critic regarding the, the development model, how the how the states must lead this transformation. The International Monetary for, uh, Fund are also asking for more tax for for this green ha green gas emissions and the uh, environment deterioration. I think it has in the in the cathedral in London was. Uh, built in all based in the taxes of to carbon. I think the pressure of the citizens is very important. I think it's a shame 
that this this problem uh, um, must be administered also by people that are responsible and to take the decisions uh, that are important for this. And uh, we must ask, ask ourselves what kind of a world we are given to our uh, children. There are different kinds of thoughts that I, with, that I think that we have to uh, take to guarantee to to maintain the, the, the sustainability of the fund. Thank you very much, Herman. We have a really good path here with different ideas, all very important to, to follow. Any other, any other one who has to, to talk about it, what other recommendations could we have? Could you tell? Silvia, please. I think that one of the most important subjects is uh, there are recognition, effective recognition of participation of the people on different nationalities that are, are in those territories. Many of, many times there are different uh, strategies that are being implemented in the conservation of biodiversity. Uh, we can we talk about their existence, but definitely it is not recognized their rights and their own development processes of the development of the community, indigenous communities. And from the point of view of the conservation biodiversity in which they incorporate these uh, communities, we must also make them participant of the decision making. So it is very far away that we can recognize the participation, the effective participation of the people and the nationalities in the take and addition taken regarding the, uh, the process of the conservation we have in the territories. So we see it, uh, what we want from our optics, but we still don't uh, interiorize that in the internal process of, that has uh, this thing related with our communities. And that has a problem that is regarding to the conservation of implementation Implementing this, um, and also regarding to the government, and that would be some of the recommendations that we could give. Thank you very much, Silvio. Thank you. I agree with what Silvio said. Uh, indigenous participation on all that Herman said, what is very complete. His presentation was very complete, and I appreciate it. I think there are some issues that we have to talk about without a including that the indigenous people can participate in the benefits of the indigenous of the Western world and say yes, but we have, many times we have to say that, yes, we have to share the benefits of the economical part. Yes, it is true, but we have to take care of and, uh, and to talk about, we have to talk about is that the indigenous have the vision of the world. Like Herman said, the problem is an ethical problem. The technology can help us, but the problem is ethical. How can we relate with our environment, who we are, in relation with their environment. We belong to a community or do we own this? This is a fundamental area. The science is very important. The problem is solved uh, the, the, in our consciousness. Is it is an ethical problem and the indigenous people have a vision of the environment. It is fundamental for so thousands of years in, of relationship with the jungle. And in this process, and uh, in, not only in the economic and the political part, we have to be very careful that uh, the vision is strengthened in, in their culture also, and they don't become a consumption society. And I don't mean that they exclude the, exclude them from the benefits. But the danger is that if I'm seeing this in the Amazon is that many people are entering the consumption society and they're entering the West society that is accumulative and in individualist and that is eroding the traditional vision with the environment and repeat is not to exclude is that we from the west have a conscious that there's a deep thought fundamental that we have to empower that we have to give the strength to other vision of the world to other way of being a human being to relate with the environment and not to become like all of us because in our economic 
become models in development, we are destroying our environment. So it is very important because we have a treasure here there. Don't destroy that. Let's strengthen that, giving it the whole participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. If I can just add to what Martin said, every industry of development is always economic, and in many ways it misses the point. You know, climate change has become humanity's problem. It was not caused by humanity. It was caused by a very narrow subset of humanity that for 300 years has consumed the ancient sunlight of the world. You know, we tend to think of ourselves as the way and everybody else is a failed attempt at being us. But we, of course, are a product of our history and culture. And critically, in the European tradition, when we try to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith during the Enlightenment, when Descartes said that all that exists is mind and matter, in a single gesture, he threw out all notions of myth, magic, but critically, metaphor. And the world was deanimated. And the world became a stage upon which the human drama alone unfolded. Plants and animals were just props in that drama. Now we have to understand that the power of that idea, which gave us the scientific method, which gave us allopathic medicine, wondrous things, but its ubiquity should not suggest it's the norm. Most societies do not have that kind of extractive model. We have not we have not, most societies have not deanimated the world. Uh, for most societies, the flight of a bird still has meaning. And what I mean by that is that if you're raised to believe that a mountain is an apu deity or that a forest is the abode of the spirits, you will have a different attitude toward them than if you're raised to believe that a mountain is simply rock or a forest is simply cellulose. Now, the important thing is not who's right and who's wrong, who is to say. The important thing is how the belief system plays out in terms of the ecological footprint of a people. If you believe that the earth is inanimate, that it's simply a resource to be exploited, as is the ideology of the West, um, then you go ahead and do it. But if you believe that a mountain is an apodidi that will direct your destiny, you'll have a different attitude toward it. Now, I'm not suggesting we all adopt the belief systems of either the Runakuna or the Kwakwakawak here in British Columbia, but I am suggesting that the majority of people of the world do not interact with the world in an extractive modality, but within a recipro reciprocal modality. Some iteration of the basic idea that the earth owes its bounty to people, but people in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. That's why for the Mamos, for example, people aren't the problem. The elder brother are the solution because only through the human imagination can, can the wonder of the Madre Creadora become realized. Now, again, I'm not suggesting in any way that we abandon uh, our industrial lives and attempt to emulate the lives of indigenous people. But what I am suggesting is that the very existence, the very existence of these alternative ways of thinking, these other visions of life itself, which actually are the majority in the human experience, put the absolute lie to those of us in our own culture who say that we cannot change as we know we must change the absolutely fundamental way in which we interact with this living planet. The atmosphere is 12 miles deep, that is it. I've been many times to Mount Everest and the most extraordinary thing about Mount Everest is you get up in the morning, you have your coffee and your breakfast, you put on your boots and by your own motor skills, your own locomotion, you can walk and climb to an area where you cannot breathe because there is no oxygen. And if that doesn't tell you how fragile the biosphere is, nothing else will. So we don't need, we're not talking about following the ways of indigenous people any more than we want them to follow our ways. It's the question is what kind of world do we want to live in as a species? And how can that world be one that can be sustained uh, over the generations. Muchas gracias, Wade. Thank you. Thank Wade. you very much, Wade. Yuri? Yes. Um, 
I guess I wanted to just pull out sort of three ideas and that build on what others have talked about. One is, I think that um, in, in sort of Western culture, one of the biggest challenges is that there's, we're saving nature by the very nature of the way we say that we're suggesting that humans are separate of nature. And I think one of the opportunities and the needs is actually to connect people and, and, and help people generally understand that humans are part of nature. Um, and I think, you know, certainly in North America this year with uh, the number of calamities, including the, the incredible heat waves that we're experiencing, um, I, I'm hopeful that people will feel it. But I think that brings to my second point, this idea of biocultural diversity conservation and the great studies out there that show that um, you know, in many parts of the world, those large intact places that are left are on indigenous lands because they are part of nature and they recognize that they are part of nature um, and, and that there's a codependence on those pieces. The third thing I wanted to say um, you know, around the conversations of indigenous peoples is I think in many places in the Americas, um, indigenous peoples have lost their ability to self-determination. And I think the challenge that, um, that the states or federal governments face is, um, is that they, they ultimately have to cede authority and, and believe in indigenous leadership um, to uh, provide that fundamental right of self-determination to back to indigenous peoples. And many, uh, you know, and, and that's hard because it generates a, a large amount of fear uh, with many different people. And I think it needs to be squarely addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jody. If there is no, no one else who will comment, I think we can continue with the conclusions. Anyone else would like to contribute with anything? Well, I will try to draw some conclusions and I will ask you to help me in case I'm not um, consolidating all important messages that you have all shared with us. I believe that in first place, what we have to consider here is that as first was mentioned, we have to reach a peace agreement with nature. I think that we need to develop a new model, a new vision of the world that incorporates other visions, other alternative visions. And in the case of the Amazon, it incorporates the vision of the different indigenous populations. Our Western culture, unfortunately, has been more extractivist than other, than other cultures, and this has resulted in the collapse that we are witnessing at the moment. So in the 21st century, we would have to incorporate other perspectives of the world. It doesn't consider only the economy, although the bioeconomy is one of the solutions, but as it is also an economic ingredient, we must think in the ethical and moral aspect of it, which is not necessarily encoded in our laws. As we mentioned in the Ecuador example, it is time to decode it, and as we saw in the Colombian example as well, it gives or, or gives the intention to give the right of these conservation areas a legal entity or a legal subject where it was not there. So we have to consolidate great dialogue, great discussions to incorporate the different perspectives. The Andes Atlantic Amazon Corridor is key for the Amazon conservation and for the world, because then it would be protecting the flying rivers, which are vital for water production and good quality air at a local and regional level, a global level. 
we are with the same uh, point of break, which uh, an international discussion is needed at least to reach 30% of conservation in the world. But our actual goal should be more ambitious, not only considering a 30% better, uh, better managed 30%, but also in the whole world, looking for corridor connectivities, including an indigenous connectivity. Well, I think that I am trying to sum up this rich conversation. If anyone would like to add anything else before finishing, we have uh, the microphone is open. Or I can give Martin the floor to finish this interesting discussion. Martin, thank you, Avisita. I would like to add a brief comment. I congratulate you for your uh, closing remarks. I have an admiration for you because of your efforts as well. I think there's uh, something implicit, maybe it was not mentioned. In uh, Wade stressed this issue as well. We have to uh, go through an awareness process, understanding that we do not have all solutions. We have to know that other cultures have other perspectives, perspectives on how to be human in living with nature. I think it is implicit we are part of nature because our evolution goes from the galactic, biological, and cultural aspects. We didn't mention that, but what's implicit is education. We recognize that this is a huge effort. There is huge efforts in the university schools to be aware that we are part of nature, that we are part of a great community with the rest of species. And if, it's, if, a, if the whole is not good, the part is not good. I think there is an ethical change that must be done and that must be included in the conclusions. Even though we didn't directly mention it, it is implicit. We understand that we should not carry with this vision and we are not only talking about an economy based on the ecology. We should change the way we see the relation with the environment. And it was just a comment that I wanted to add. Congratulations for your closing remarks. Anyone would like to add some comments before we close this excellent panel? We have any other comments? I see there's silence. So thank you very much, everyone for your presence to and also for guiding us through this conversation. It was exceptional. Thank you very much to each and one of you. Your presentations were excellent. Each and one of you from your own perspectives and vision. So with this, we finish this four webinar series. We are considering the debate of the Convention on Biological Diversity in the future to 10 years and how to reinforce the protection of the environment and how we are stressing the importance of that within our, our culture. I believe that us, with our own perspective, we want uh, resolve the problem that we cause. We have to establish a conversation with every single culture and different cultures. There are many ways of thinking and many different cultures, and that is fundamental for the planet as a whole. So thank you very much, everyone, for your contribution and your participation. And with that, we finish this panel. If anyone would like to comment anything, feel free to do so. Thank you very much.